Well, this may not seem a very wise move to make in January, but today we're moving north, over the Alps, to what would become the nations of France, Belgium, Holland, and Germany. For us, it's also a journey backward in time to the 1400s, to the world of Brunelleschi, Donatello, and Botticelli. But when we look at these illuminated manuscript pages, it seems as if we're really returning to the Middle Ages, an era of lords and peasants, of rival nobles commanding often small fiefs from fortified castles, of knights on horseback and serfs in the field. This world lives on in this beautiful book of ours, uh, a guide to daily prayers created by the Limburg brothers for the Duke of Berry, the younger brother of the King of France. The brilliant colors evoke the stained glass windows of high Gothic French cathedrals. The sumptuously detailed clothing evokes the international Gothic style. And note, there are no obvious bodies under these clothes. Uh, in this uh, calendar segment for May, we also see the courtly dress and the highly stylized horses. Yet only six months of the calendar are devoted to the nobility. Every other month shows scenes from the everyday life of the peasantry, what art historians call genre painting. Sometimes these scenes of ordinary people are romanticized, sometimes they're starkly realistic, but the inclusion of genre scenes still represents a new departure in art, and hints that the lower classes are going to find a new place in painting, just as they're going to find a new role in society and even in time in politics. So we see some other Renaissance hints in this second genre painting. What are they? Well, there's a touch of perspective. Notice how the line of shrubbery moves in an angle toward the back. The castle's not really correctly depicted from the standpoint of perspective, but the artists have carefully employed shading to give it three dimensions. Still, the world the Limburg brothers captured in their wonderful Book of Hours is a feudal world where territories, often quite small territories, were ruled by powerful nobles, where kings for the most part were quite weak, and where the economic and social gulf between lords and peasants was huge and almost never breached. In this world, popes and kings fought for political and economic control, often quite literally in the battlefield. Julius II wasn't called the warrior pope because he got into so many fights with Michelangelo. So what changed all that? Why did feudalism end and give way to what non-art historians call early modern Europe? I've given you some of the answers in earlier units when I talked about the tragedies of the 14th century. So what do you remember? Well, there was the plague, which killed off as much as half the population. And what effect would you guess this had on relations between nobles and their serfs? So think of it this way. What would happen to high school students earning minimum wage at part-time jobs and to their employers if senioritis suddenly became a fatal disease and spread to other grades and half the high school students in America dropped dead? Well, you'd spend a lot of time attending funerals, but you'd also gain some serious economic bargaining power uh, as McDonald's and Starbucks fought for the remaining teenage labor. Similarly, nobles eager to keep their remaining serfs on the land had to grant these serfs more rights, and many left anyway to occupy now abandoned lands or to work for more accommodating nobles or to take up trades in the growing towns. Another 14th century tragedy was the schism in the church. As the papacy first moved to Avignon, then suffered through a period where there were competing popes in Avignon and Rome. Uh, this is a painting by Vasari showing the return of the popes to Rome, an event that loomed large in our last unit. So what would you guess was the impact of the church split up north? Well, basically, the schism in the church weakened the pope's authority, since competing popes needed to appeal to political rulers for support. England, for example, supported the popes in Rome in order to weaken France. The French, on the other hand, liked having the popes living nearby in Avignon, where they could keep them under their thumbs. For ordinary people, however, the discord in the church, combined with what seemed like the clergy's growing corruption and preoccupation with personal wealth, led to a search for a more individual, personal, or satisfying religion. No, Northern Europeans did not turn away from Christianity. In fact, um, Northern European humanism is also often referred to as Christian humanism. It took a more religious turn in the North. 
Uh, instead, many Northern Europeans began to join co-fraternities. These are religious organizations that were not made up of the clergy. Others focused on, took pilgrimages or focused on other elements of personal devotion. And in response, they paid for art that helped them in this pursuit, such as the Book of Hours that we've just seen. Uh, but it wasn't just tragedy that reshaped the Europe emerging in the 15th century. Uh, pardon me here, by the way. I just could not resist as we move here giving you a little more historical background, which I think is, in fact, going to be relevant to the art. At any rate, uh, inventions and ingenuity made a big difference in this period as well. Back when I taught AP European History at Juan Diego, I told my class on the first day of school that we were going to begin the course rather arbitrarily on August 26th, 1346. Now, I made my class guess why, what that date might mean, uh, but I'll go ahead and tell you that this is the daddle, date excuse me, of the Battle of Crecy, which is one of the many battles of the Hundred Years' War. So, why might I have picked that particular battle and that particular date? Let's watch the video clip I used to start off my AP Euro class, and then I'll pose that question again. So, do you have a theory about why I started early modern history with this battle? Actually, there are a number of reasons. It's estimated that more than a third of French knights, that is all the knights in France, died on that single day, defeated by a bunch of upstart English peasants. As the narrator, who is, by the way, the noted military historian John Keegan, one of my favorite authors, uh, as he notes, warfare after Crecy belonged increasingly to the infantry, and that ended the reign of the knights. Raising and maintaining a large infantry army was expensive, however, and it was a job more easily undertaken by large political entities and kings than by nobles with a small fief. Moreover, once armament makers figured out how to make cannons and then muskets that actually hit what they were aimed at and not just blow up and kill the people holding them, fortified castles no longer provided much protection. It used to take weeks or months to lay siege to a castle. A uh, well-aimed cannon could take a castle down a day. So, this also made it easier for kings to bring unruly new nobles under control. And it gave still more importance to the common soldiers, uh, this time the artillery, and put more pressure on kings to expand their holdings so they could afford these expensive new armies. So in this period, and even more the period that follows, we see the rise of what historians would call the new monarchies, powerful kingdoms in Spain, France, and England. Italy, by contrast, would suffer. Its smaller city-states had trouble raising an infantry, and its small mercenary forces could no longer defend it. Italy would be invaded and sacked by both the Holy Roman Empire and France in the late 15th and 16th centuries. Finally, the commercial revolution moved north of Italy, especially after the Portuguese and Spanish navigators discovered the New World and the center of the trade really moved to the Atlantic. The center of the northern commercial, commercial revolution was Flanders. Now, that's not a name we really use anymore, but it's an area that encompassed Holland, Belgium, and northern France as they are today. In this unit, Flanders is ruled first by the Dukes of Burgundy and then by the Holy Roman Empire. You can see from the map that Flanders was strategically located for trade with England, France, and the Holy Roman Emperor. Also, the flat topography of that land made it travel into the heart of Europe relatively easy. Italians had to go over the Alps, which was not so easy. Like Florence, Flanders included rich industrial and banking cities, and this allowed a large middle-class population to flourish. The courts of the Dukes of Burgundy were the most imp the court of the Dukes of Burgundy were the most important patrons during this time. But newly wealthy private citizens also commissioned art, and particularly as part of this growing interest in private meditation and prayer. They also commissioned portraits in growing numbers. Okay, I realize this is an almost impossibly complicated map, and that's actually why I included it. Uh, the Dukes of Burgundy acquired Flanders through a series of dynastic marriages and complex feudal arrangements. This wasn't really a new monarchy yet. Here you see the areas ruled by the Burgundian kingdom, and the northern orange portions are Flanders. The Burgundian Dukes were actually a junior branch of the French royal family, but during the Hundred Years' War, they more or less broke off from France, which was a very weak state at the time, and allied with France's enemy, the English. Uh, this actually made sense from an economic standpoint, since England's major product was raw wool from sheep, and Flanders produced wool and cloth. Note, too, that the ports of Flanders are actually quite close to England. 
The Burgundian kingdom, by the way, essentially disappeared in 1477 when the last duke died in battle and left no heirs. The territory reverted to France, whose kings were in the process of consolidating and expanding their kingdom into one of the first great nation states. French royal patronage will loom increasingly large in our story. And indeed, that will be true of royal patronage in general. But for now, let's look at the spectacular art that Flanders, that is the Flemish, uh, or really the Flemish and the Dutch, produced in the 15th century. The term Dutch will come into use later. So as you saw in the podcast, Philip the Bold of Burgundy, Duke of Burgundy, loved the Carthusian monks and designed this monastery in Dijon, France, as his final resting place. The hexagonal fountain depicts six patriarchs and prophets, Moses, David, Daniel, Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Zechariah. Originally, a crucifix topped the fountain with the water of life flowing symbolically down from the cross. Now, I've juxtaposed jam sculptures from Chartres Cathedral about a century and a half earlier. So what differences do you notice? Well, Sluter's figures are less angular. The drapery is more free-flowing. And in general, the figures are more liberated from their architectural framework. We also see more differentiation of texture. This is a little tough to pick up from the slide, but it will turn out to be a major characteristic of Northern Renaissance work, especially when it comes to painting fabric and metal or glass surfaces, that is surfaces that reflect light. So here you see more detail from the statue. Only a few, although only a few flakes remain, these statues would have been vividly painted and that would have made them, of course, even more naturalistic. We've seen the well from the Carthusian Monastery. This is the altarpiece, also commissioned by Philip the Bull. I love that name. As your textbook notes, the paintings mix and match architectural styles. Now, it may be, this is one theory, that the classical rotunda is a reference to the Old Testament and the Gothic porch is a reference to the New Testament. It may also be that we're seeing a combination of older Gothic and newer Renaissance styles could be both. In what other ways does this work seem to blend the medieval and the Renaissance? Well, the gold black background and the rather flat stylized figures are medieval, and so are the very defined halos. But look at that wild landscape and the use of architecture to render three-dimensional space. Those signal a move toward the Renaissance. This is an interesting diagram, I thought. Uh, I didn't put it together. I found it. Uh, but it shows you that, this, that the artist's efforts to render three-dimensional space are not altogether successful, at least by Italian Renaissance standards. It's hard to identify a clear vanishing point or horizon line. Still, the painting does represent a move toward perspective and more optical art. But if perspective isn't fully developed, the use of light and shadow really more closely resembles the work of the High Renaissance and artists such as Leonardo, Michelangelo, and Titian. So any thought as to how the artist might have accomplished this? Well, if you guessed oil paint, good job. Broder Lam was one of the first artists to experiment with oil paint. The extraordinarily detailed surfaces, the careful depiction of reflected light and texture, I just talked about that, the glowing surfaces of Northern Renaissance painting owe much of their beauty to this new medium. Well, I was looking around for a good video on how oil painting changed art, and I landed back with our good friends at Khan Academy, and back in the Italian Renaissance, Venice in fact. Well, you can at least be thankful I did not assign still another podcast during that very podcast-heavy unit. So let's watch it now. Uh, this particular altarpiece is probably much smaller than you imagine. It was not made for a chapel or church. It was made for the patrons to keep in their own home. While our previous altarpiece including, included many naturalistic elements, the setting still seemed fanciful. It was not a real place in which real per humans might have lived. In this altarpiece, that separation between heaven and earth is really challenged. Although the patrons are kneeling outside the kitchen where the Annunciation took place, you could easily imagine that the room was a real room in their home. This is the earliest Annunciation panel set in a fully detailed domestic interior. Here, too, the artist has made a consistent attempt to render a complete spatial reality. It's not the same space from one panel to another, and the perspective is not really accurate, but still, every detail is very concrete, meticulously rendered. 
uh, and again enhanced by what is still a technical innovation, overlaying translucent oil pigments on aqueous opaque pigments. Uh, if you get to this fi my final video on Van Eyck's en enunciation, you'll get an illustration of how this is done. But the result is a luminous enamel-like surface that includes many color values and manages to depict both the depth and gradations of light. There's more subtlety in oil as well as more brilliance. Uh, but the initial impression that this is an ordinary space is a little deceptive. Many of the seemingly ordinary objects, in fact, have a second or symbolic meaning. The artist's goal seems to have been making sacred symbols look like part of the natural world. Uh, and by the way, this union of symbolism and realism is characteristic of 15th century Northern European paintings. Uh, it's a union which makes the secular world sacred uh, and may help explain why donors wanted their portraits included in altarpieces and other religious paintings that they commissioned. It's also kind of a precursor to some of the notions of the Reformation where the access of ordinary people to the sacred was, was enhanced in the theology. So the lily in the pitcher of water symbolizes the virgin's purity. The candle symbolizes Christ's divinity. And the fact that it's been extinguished suggests that God has put on human flesh, has, you know, in a sense, moved away from his godliness temporarily. The mousetrap, by the way, that's what Joseph is making, demonstrates that Christ's incarnation, which is what's being announced in the central panel, is God's plan for ensnaring, for trapping the devil. Uh, notice, by the way, how exquisitely the artist renders the tools and the metal surface of the candlestick. Again, no one does textures and surfaces better than the painters of the Northern Renaissance and their artistic heirs whom we'll meet in Dutch Baroque painters such as Rembrandt. We don't know much about Jean Van Eyck's personal background or training, although his inscriptions suggest he had a classical education. In 1425, he entered the service of Philip the Good of Burgundy, whom he served not only as a court painter, but also as a diplomat and administrator. This is probably a self-portrait. I'm going to discuss Van Eyck's portraits in my second lecture on the Northern Renaissance. For now, we're going to be looking at altarpieces. Oops, that politic belonged here, not in the previous one. I should have eliminated that. Uh, before the printing press and the Reformation brought the Bible to the Northern European masses, altarpieces were one of the most important devices for teaching Christian narratives and Christian theology. Mostly viewed when closed, these politics or connected multi-panel paintings would be opened up during mass and feast days and they would reveal this wonderful world of color and action. So it would add to the drama of the mass and of the occasion and be sort of like a movie opening. Uh, the series of images allowed artists to create a narrative without employing the somewhat more awkward technique of displaying continuous narration in a single work. This huge altarpiece, 11 and a half by 15 feet when open, actually I've heard both 15 and 17, uh, still stands in St. Bavo Cathedral in Ghent, which is a city that's now part of Belgium and was the probably the most uh, commercially wealthy city in Flanders at the time. Uh, we see wealthy donors at the bottom left and right, Contrasting with that grisaille, remember that grayscale, uh, fake sculptures of the prophet Zechariah and Micah, whom Christian theologian viewed as predicting Christ's incarnation. Note, by the way, how spectacularly Van Eyck uses light and shadow to convey three dimensions in these sort of grayed uh, fake sculptures. On the top panel, we see sibyls. Remember these from the Sistine Chapel ceiling. In the center is an Annunciation. And what's so interesting about this is that dramatic, almost empty center that looks through the city to Flemish city, uh, through the window, excuse me, to Flemish city and invites us into the story. I've said I'll talk about portraits in my next lecture, but it's worth noting the highly realistic, and in this case, not really especially flattering portrayals. This would be typical of Flemish and Dutch painting. One interesting detail, remember that Scrovegni, the donor of the Arena Chapel that Giotto painted so brilliantly, was worried about how Dante portrayed his father as suffering in hell for, for usury, for lending money and interest. Well, this donor's father had been the Duke of Burgundy's treasurer, and he was sent to prison for theft. So this hugely expensive donation was a peace offering to the kingdom, to the Duke, and probably also seen as a down payment on his journey to heaven. So just a few noteworthy elements in the central panel. Unlike the Grisai figures of the saints at the lower level, these figures are modeled in soft tones of muslin. This is, remember, it was a cloth-oriented culture. 
uh, making the iridescent angel's wings even a greater contrast. Notice too that the spoken words are included in the painting and Mary's are upside down so that they can be more easily read by God. Hmm. Uh, the towel, the pitcher, and the ewer in the central panels all symbolize virginity and purity and the trefoil window symbolizes the trinity. So then you open the polyptych and you enter this brilliantly colored world with multiple layers of meaning. Uh, note that the bottom landscape, by the way, is continuous across the panels with the lamb and the well of water of life centered directly below God the Father. Uh, the nude figures of Adam and Eve represent an innovation in Northern Renaissance art, probably reflecting an Italian influence. But the highly realistic, detailed, individualized faces are typical of the North. Notice, too, Adam's foreshortened foot and Eve's, partly at least, contrapposto stance. We are seeing uh, Italian Renaissance items, by the way, just to add a humorous note. Uh, in the 19th century, the cathedral officials got nervous about having naked men and women there in the cathedral during Mass, and so these figures were repainted and these panels were replaced with these figures, uh, which were clothed. In the 20th century, the church officials came to their senses and the clothes came off. So how is God portrayed here? Kind of an interesting, odd portrayal, I mean, particularly when you think of the way that Michelangelo portrays God in the Sistine Chapel. So he's wearing a papal tiara. He has a worldly crown at his feet. This is not a Reformation image. This is a pope as a world and church ruler. Uh, Mary, you note, is portrayed, as she often is, as the Queen of Heaven. Uh, there are and on the right, by the way, is John the Baptist. There are inscriptions over all three figures. Uh, the one over God, the Father reads, this is in your textbook, this is God, all powerful in his divine majesty, of all the best by the gentleness of his goodness, the most liberal giver because of his infinite generosity. So you have the symbolism of the scepter, crown, and tiara supporting this powerful, you know, sort of Byzantine-style world ruler God. Yet the language, and I would say also God's sort of calm and peaceful face, convey the message of Christian humanism. Note, too, the use of hierarchy of scale. So Byzantine and medieval conventions have not yet disappeared. Uh, by the way, these figures were probably painted by Jean van Eyck's brother Hubert, who began this work. John van Eyck finished it after his brother's de death, and art historians have a lot of fun trying to guess who painted what. You are not going to need to know that, and I don't think we really know anyway. Uh, one of the lectures I listened to stated that these are the only angels in Flemish painting that don't have wings. Don't know, but that's interesting. But note that, again, this was a cloth-oriented culture. That's how they made their fortunes. And notice this beautifully rendered cloth and the extremely detailed musical instruments. Uh, the Flemish were also famous for the quality of their musical instruments, which was another major export product. Also note the highly individual faces. These are, these are angels expressing very different responses to the music. You could imagine a real choir looking like that. Now, the bottom panel uh, has abundant symbols. So what do you notice? Well, most prominent, there's the Lamb of God, whose heart is bleeding into a chalice symbolizing the Eucharist. The octagonal fountain is the fountain of the water of life. It's spewing forth living water. Uh, the, the, a slide doesn't capture Van Eyck's mastery of color and texture. Uh, while he was not, is no longer considered the inventor of oil painting as he was for a long time, he was one of its great masters. And oil paints permitted more nuanced uh, textures, more translucent portrayals of life, more modulated color. So what shape defines this composition? Well, it's kind of a pyramid, which, as you recall, was also popular in the Italian Renaissance and symbolic of the Trinity. Uh, the perspective is more intuitive than mathematical. Brunelleschi would not have approved. So here's a closer look at how at what is sometimes referred to as the mystic lamb. The symbolism is pretty clear. Okay, this beautiful Annunciation by Van Eyck is not in your textbook. I'm hoping you're going to have time in class uh, or in the next class to watch at least some of a video excerpt about this work. Uh, 
it's great to watch because it has really good close-ups. These works need to be looked at close up and you can't really do that from a page in a book. Uh, also, it gives some very interesting, I thought, insights into Van Eyck's painting technique. It shows you how this oil painting was done. In my next lecture, I'm going to begin by looking at an equally famous altarpiece, Roger van der Weyden's Deposition. Then we're going to examine Northern Renaissance portraiture and if we can get to it in the next lecture, see how a second invention, even more powerful, I would argue, than gunpowder, began to transform art and the world.